Extra special thanks to Cincy Music for co-hosting My Favorite Album is Terrible. For the best in what Cincinnati's amazing local music scene has to offer, be sure to follow them on Instagram at Cincy Music, that's Cincy with a Y, on Facebook at CincyMusic.com, also Cincy with a Y, and on their official website, www.CincyMusic.com. Here's the show. All right, everybody. Hi. Welcome to My Favorite Album is Terrible. My name is Kent Mulcahy with the Cincinnati Public Library. And what we're going to do here on this show every other Thursday at 8 o'clock, we're going to take a look at an album by an artist or a band that critics or otherwise fans of that artist just seem to really, really hate. And important distinction, we're not talking about guilty pleasures. To me, a guilty pleasure is something that you like, but if you're being completely honest with yourself, you know it's probably not that good. That's not what we're talking about. What we are going to talk about on this show are albums where whoever picks that album, they truly believe that it is a good album, that it is a good representation of that artist, and that everyone else is wrong. So, not a guilty pleasure. So, the way the format of the show is going to work is each week a host is going to pick an album to defend against the world. Then we will have a guest, or in some cases, guests, who have to listen to every second of that album that the host picked, and then have a back and forth with them. The spin, however, is that the guest is not allowed to say anything negative about that album. So the way it could play out is one of three ways. One, maybe the the guest listens to the album and they decide, you know what, this really isn't that bad. I, you know, my mind has changed, in which case they will just join the host and take on the rest of the world and prove everyone wrong. The second thing that could happen is that the guest listens to it, didn't really care for it, but you know, they, they found a few things they liked, so they will focus on the silver linings of the album instead of just bashing the stuff they didn't like. The third option that could happen is the guest listens to it, hates it, can't find a single nice thing to say about it. Well, guess what? You still have to talk about it with the host. In that case, you if you want to insult the album, you can do so, but you have to do it in, what, I don't know, passive-aggressive, snarky phrases that at least sound like compliments. So that's kind of the way this show will take its form. Uh, Side note, everything that we talk about on this show, every album, every book, everything that's even remotely related to the album that we talk about will all be available to you freely with your Cincinnati Public Library card. So each week, check the comment section. We will put direct links so you can join us and listen along with everything we talk about here. Most of what we talk about is probably going to come from our digital music services, Hoopla and Freegal, which is our, our downloading and streaming music services. But you know what? We may pull from our CD collection or our incredibly impressive collection of vinyl. Either way, it's all going to be free to you with your library card. Speaking to the comments section, I would love for people to join us in this discussion tonight. If you have thoughts on the album we're going to talk about, please jump in and let us know, but the same rules apply to you. If you do not like the album we're talking about, you have to get really creative with how you want to insult it, and at any time we will also jump in the comments section. Yeah, the the host, by the way, has at any time has the right to jump in and object to a comment made by a guest, have it stricken from the record, and then force the guest who made the perceived negative comment to rephrase it in a positive way. If you like what you're hearing tonight, give us a like, and very importantly, if you think you know people who would enjoy this and would want to join in on the conversation, please give us a share. We really want this to be an interactive thing, so the more the merrier. Please let people jump into this, and so give us a share and help us get the word out about this show. All right, so in a second, we are going to bring on tonight's guest. Tonight's guest is going to be Keith Good, also from the Cincinnati Public Library. And Keith has picked an album by the band Weezer. He has picked the Red album, which was released in 2008. I'm going to assume we don't need to go through a long introduction of the band Weezer. Suffice it to say, there are two kinds of Weezer fans. There are the people who generally seem to enjoy most of everything they've put out, and they've put out a lot of albums at this point. And then there are people, admittedly like me, who after they released their first two albums, the Blue Album and then Pinkerton, 
they literally tricked their mind into believing that Weezer retired after Pinkerton and that a fake Weezer took over with 2001's Green Album. And that is the only way they can wrap their heads around what Weezer is doing these days. All right, and so with that, we'll bring on Keith. Keith he works at the Green Township branch of our Cincinnati Public Library. He, uh, when we were chatting before this, he wanted me to let everybody know that he is the former front man of Cincinnati's, and this is his words, Cincinnati's okayest bar band. And all right, so with that, let's bring on Keith Good. Keith, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing well, thanks. All right, so in this uh, bar band, did you do any Weezer covers? So not only did we do Weezer covers in the bar band, uh, a Weezer cover was our demo disc that we would give to the bar owners to get us on stage to begin with. And okay, what song was it? Uh, it was Beverly Hills. Sadly, not on the Red Album. Sadly? <laughs> is it sad that Beverly can Hills... Strike, can I strike that? Is it too early to start striking Red No, or that's or not about the Red that? Album. That's not about the Red Album. Okay. It only. Okay. I'm making this up as I go. I just now decided that the negative comments, that rule only applies to the album that we're discussing tonight. Okay. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah, we're just going to go with it. Um, <laughs> so before we totally jump into it, just a couple of quick questions. So when, what's your history with Weezer? When did you jump in and become a Weezer fan? <clears throat> so I jumped in uh, with their first record. I don't know how old I was. That would have been like 1994, 95. It was actually uh, <clears throat> along with Weird Al's Alapalooza and Billy Joel's River of Dreams, the first CDs I ever purchased. All right. All of those which showed up a lot in those BMG catalogs of uh, albums. Exactly. Then, exactly. Yeah. I joined shortly thereafter. <laughs> yeah. So what was the first Weezer song that you heard? Was it the video, by the way, or just the song? What was the first thing you heard from them? It was Buddy Holly. It was the... the for it sure. might have even been uh, Buddy Holly. It was a huge hit on MTV, but it was also included on the build of Windows 95. Like if you got a computer with Windows 95, it was preloaded onto that computer. Really? really? All right. I did not know that. All right. So, you know, it's been played out. I To talk about the Blue Album, to talk about Pinkerton, you know, those are widely regarded as fantastic discs. So I'm not going to hammer away at that. What I'm going to go with is, what was your, you mentioned the album Make Believe with the song Beverly Hills on it. Beverly Hills, yeah. Now, so how did you feel about Make Believe and wh how did that set your expectations up for what was going to come from the next Weezer album? Yeah, so that, that, at that point in time, I was still like purchasing every album on release day and I was a little disappointed by Make Believe. Okay, I, I stopped. I bought the Green Album. Uh, my buddy and I listened to it on the way home from Best Buy after being there when it opened. We listened to it once, took it out, didn't really talk about it, and um, that was... <laughs> it just never happened. It never, it happened. never happened. That was kind of the end of it for me. Okay, so you didn't really care for it, and so what did you think they were going to do? Did you expect them a return to form? Did you expect them to just push further in the direction they were going? So yeah, I, at that point, I was the kind of Weezer fan who was actually very active on the message boards. So I had, <laughs> thanks. So I had heard a little bit of the leaked demos and I knew that, that the Red Album, they intentionally wanted to be a departure from Make Believe. So I was actually quite excited. Okay, all right. That's, I, I was not part of that scene. I did not know that. I, you know, it, with every Weezer album that comes out, someone says it's a return to form. So in a way, that's... that's what they say for every one of them. Yes, that's yeah, correct. I, yeah, absolutely. So the first official song that you heard, was it a video? Was it, was Pork and Beans the first single, I think? I don't think it was. Oh, okay. I think okay. Troublemaker, I think, was the first track. Really? Uh, but wow. I think that was the first single. Okay. You can fact check me in the comments. Uh, <laughs> but no, I was uh, my, the first track I heard from the Red Album was was the lead track in the album I bought it the day it came out. Okay. Well, it sounds like I'm going to guess since you were already set up for it to not be a return to form, probably kind of okay with that. Yeah, yeah. it was. Uh, it was. I really. I mean, I'm willing to defend this album to people. So I That's true. have been, will be. Am okay with the Red Album. It's a good album. We'll get there. Um, <laughs> did you read the reviews at the time when it came out? I did not read the reviews at the time. I did know that when Rolling Stone 
um, release the album's release date and the name and the first single, they happened to make that news on April 1st, and people thought it was an April Fool's Day joke. Um, because they it. announced, it might have been, I think Pork and Beans actually was the first single now that I mentioned, because people thought saw that Pork and Beans was the single, and they yeah. thought, certainly this is a joke. Yeah, with a title like that. But <laughs> All right, so um, last question before I turn it over to you. So sure. did, did you have a lot of like music friends who were Weezer fans at the time that you would discuss Weezer with, or were you kind of solo on this? No, I had one coworker at uh, where I worked, and I think he was also a Weezer fan. So we discussed it a little bit, but I don't think, I don't think he was on my level, Kent. Well, that's what I'm getting at. So with, with the one person that you discussed it with and maybe on the message board, was there a wealth of people like yourself talking about how it was good, or were you kind of, since day one, defending it? There's always, I mean, especially on those message boards, there's always a wealth of people who um, take your attitude that, that Weezer disappeared in 1996 forever, and it's just been a, a cover act since then. So it's always like wild, wild different opinions. I don't so mean, I've, been, I've been defending this. I don't mean to give it away, like the, the, the conclusion of this episode, but... I don't think I'm one of those people anymore, and it's I've got you to thank for that. Yeah, so we'll get to it. I'm not totally off that boat, but... All right, so at this point, I am going to let you take it away. I understand we have a massive um, track-by-track breakdown that we are going to do. Track-by-track breakdown. So just a few background notes. Um, This album was actually recorded in like three separate sessions in 2007 and then one in 2008. And most of it was recorded in 2007. So two of the songs uh, were <clears throat> recorded because Geffen Records demanded more radio material. And without me saying, you might be able to guess which of two, those two tracks there are. Ooh. But most of it was recorded um, with super producer Rick Rubin, who yeah. is better known for like co-founding Def Jam Records and his work with Johnny Cash. Yep. Um, but two tracks are not Rick Rubin Weezer tracks. Should I try to so guess right now? If you want, I think you can guess which two tracks because Geffen wanted two radio friendly tracks. Heart Songs jumps out as a radio friendly track. Really does it? I mean, not to me. It's not, it's not, one. It's not, not to one me, one. it doesn't. Uh, you know what? I, I, I'm going to quit. Now all of a sudden, I'm like really self conscious. Because the first, the, the release, the, the reveal here is that Troublemaker, which is the first track on the record, and that's where I'm going to start talking about it. Okay. That's one of the two songs that they went back into the studio like a month before the album was set to be mm-hmm. released, and they recorded it with. Uh, and, and then Pork and Beans. Then. Pork and, and Beans. And then Pork and Beans. Okay. Troublemaker and Pork and Beans were the two right. that. Uh, um, so yeah, Troublemaker. It's a good album opener. It's like, it's crunchy. Mm-hmm. And it's, it moves. And it's, it's short. Got that. It's short. And it's like it, the lyrics and and the, the chords, I feel like it's destined to be in the commercial for every teen movie released from here to eternity. Okay. I can totally hear that. That's my note on this track. My it's note. a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. I think uh, if I were going to comment on this track, I think it's fantastic that they opened with this one. And that way... When I first listened to it, I immediately was, you know, I know it's not going to be a return to form. I'm glad they were like right there and <laughs> honest with me. They're like, you're not going to get what you want. So um, this is not this is not vintage. No, no. But the other not. thing I want to say here is that like this whole album is filled with like really weird lyrical choices. Oh man, and that I think I think that other bands get away with like um, like somebody like they might be giants. They get away with these really weird things. For some reason, Weezer doesn't. And this one has, you wanted arts and crafts. How's this for arts and crafts? One on and on and on and on and on, that's right. Yeah. I think that's fun. Right. Uh, so, and then let's go to the next track, which is maybe my favorite track on the record. It's uh, The Greatest Man That Ever Lived, which sounds a lot like Simple Gifts, the old Shaker hymn, hence the title. Um, but I think it's just, it's a really, really big departure. Usually their songs are, uh, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, break, chorus, and that's the end of the song. Uh, this is not that. So I, I appreciate the and the departure, and they, with varying degrees of success, introduce a lot of different musical styles. If you can get past like the really cringy rap bits at the, the beginning, then the rest of it is pretty good. Here's my note on this song. I have never been made 
so uncomfortable by G-rated off-putting phrases. It's, say, it's pretty bad. The, there's bits about wizards and spells, and it's not good. It's, it's, it's but, a big ancient ship of doom off the rails. It, you just, you can't, you can't do it. I know Weezer loves classic rock, so I, I think they've been torn. It's like, do they want to write Bohemian Rhapsody, or do they want to write the best pop song ever written, or do they want to do everything in the same song? I don't think... I don't think they know, and I think that's what this song is. They're just yeah. they're just putting it, sticking it all together, and see how it works. But it does have like how many other uh, you know pop songs are going to include thirty seconds of like baroque choral breakdown? I know, and that's what yep. this has, which I think is fun. Yeah, it's it is totally f- fun. <laughs> fun. It's, it's fun. fun. Okay, it's I'm fine. gonna have it's it's fine. All right. It's fun. So then, uh, pork and beans obviously is the third track, and it's the other it's the other Geffen records. You have to put this song on, yeah. the, on the record. Makes total and, sense to me. But it, like the other, there's I mean, there's a, a category of these famous songs like um, Maroon 5's "Harder to Breathe" was a record company. You have to put this on the record. Um, All right then. Oh Sarah Bareilles' "Love Song" is another one where the record company said you have to put it on the record. I love that song. So, and like those songs, this turns out it's probably their greatest single, not greatest in terms of, but like best-selling single of all time, this Pork and Beans. Yep. So what we have is for the first three tracks, no skips. Do you agree with that or do you disagree? Well, I mean, I've made my own prison okay, here with my, with my rules. Okay, I, th- those are your words, not mine, because I, uh, okay. I can't. But comment. the reason I say that is because Heart Songs, the fourth track, is like, if we have to say if we're going to say very nice things about this record is that the last minute of this song is pretty good wow did i get there um (laughs) (laughs) i know i did i i've i listened to the album multiple times i won't lie there were some songs that after a listen or so i was like i did my time with this one here's what i can say about this one they 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 used a sneaky trick to make me not just completely discredit this song, and it's unfair that they did this. If you mention Nirvana, never mind, in a sappy way, my brain will not let me say that it is bad, all right? Because I got chills listening to this song when he brought up hearing never mind for the exactly. first time. Even though the lyrics that he uses are, well, he brings... First choice, best choice, again. Yeah, first choice, best choice. That's a good way to put it. But, yeah, I mean, it, yeah, sorry. That's, they use, they so, use Nirvana. Right, That's right. But you're right, though, that once that bit kicks in, it's a really good, like, it's a, it connects emotionally. Before that, it's just a list of songs that I'd rather listen to than this song. Yeah, I'm going I'm to push pause on this and actually listen to the stuff that, I mean, yeah, that's so funny. Hey, Edmund, the Ballad of the Edmund Fitzgerald by Gordon Lightfoot, you got to listen to that every November on the anniversary. All right. He did mention Slayer, <laughs> so, you know, I'm always looking he for does, he does. to put Slayer. So produced, by, after... produced by Rick Rubin. There's the tie really? in. Well, not produced. They, they, he signed them to uh, American or did Def he? Jam Recordings, yeah. yeah. Okay. Anyway, so but your, your reward for getting through hard songs is that you get to listen to everybody get dangerous, which is another one of these like. So I'm going to admit that my connection to this song is more personal than logical. Um, it I grew up in a rural Ohio town, so everything he's describing in the song is something that I did once I got my driver's license. I grew up in Jessamine County, Kentucky. Uh, where until they made more roads, I was 45 minutes away from the city. So. <laughs> yeah, we were uh, we were half an hour if you wanted to go to a real movie theater. Yep. So the tipping cows and stuff. And Tip, well, actually, my I, my friend was a dairy farmer, so we wouldn't have tipped any cows. So I, I would have never never did that. No. But so. no, if you replace lyrics about you know whatever car he mentions, if you were, replace that with the 87 Mercury Cougar, then it's basically me. 93. And then he's talking about is mm-hmm. a Chevy Cavalier. 93 Chevy Cavalier, yeah. Quality, quality. I drove one of those too. Uh, also, unironic, 
use of the word booyah in the chorus again some people are going to find that really cringy I, I think it's just it's just a good time if they said it with any energy at all it would have been cringy <laughs> but instead it's booyah <laughs> i mean that's, that's about it. here's the Somebody nice made them say it. here's the nicest here's what i'm going to say about this track what i really liked about this song was that the title everybody get dangerous it made me think of darkwing duck which I hadn't thought about in a while. And yes, maybe that's why I like it too. Yes, and also then it made me remember the 8-bit Nintendo game, Darkwing Duck, that I still have. And I went back and played it. That game's great. That's, that's what I can there, say about it. Like if we want to offshoot this discussion into 8-bit Nintendo games, we can put a pin there. We'll come back to Darkwing Duck later. I'm looking at the time right now. We've got a... <laughs> so, uh, but then the next track is actually, again, this is probably the best track on the record, Dreamin', because mm. it's, I feel like it's, for first of all, it, it does not start with the verse, it starts with the chorus, and it really starts with a bopper of a chorus. So yes. it's like, it's a head, it's a windows yep. down in the car, it's a air, wind flowing through your hair, sing along mm. kind of chorus. Mm -hmm. It's like the Beach Boys pushed forward into 2008. I'm not going to say that it's my favorite. There's another one that we'll get to that was my, my favorite. But yeah, other than the outro Old of this Dark song. Old Dark World was your favorite? Um, <laughs> uh, we may have to pause this for a second. Um, <laughs> other than the outro, where, where, what is it? I don't want to get on your level. or I don't want to get with, again. Yeah, that's, yeah, that was a weird I, thing. I don't want to get with your program. That's what it was. I was like, it's kind of confusing to me. I mean, it's... It, got to four minutes long i mean it would have like you said it might have been my favorite if it weren't for that and i mean it's like the harmonies again i mean it, and i don't know i didn't really do my historic homework on pop through the decades but weezer always almost have this as this 50s or 60s sensibility of harmonies and just this breeziness and yeah i this song almost it was there for a lot of the time so there's a story, and I don't, I don't know if this is true, that when Weezer went in to record the Blue Album, um, Rivers, the lead singer Rivers, was in a, a music shop, and he was deciding whether he was going to get the Beach Boys Pet Sounds or Led Zeppelin IV to listen to as motivation for the record they were about to record. And he picked Pet Sounds. I so a lot of that. what you hear with those harmonies is because they specifically were trying to emulate the Beach Boys. And there's nothing wrong with that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then after Dreamin', which is a good track, we get to three tracks, which is another departure for the band. They are not written by Rivers, the lead singer. They're written by the other members of the band. First is Thought I Knew, which is written by the guitarist Brian Bell and sung by him. It is a pretty good song. It's weighed down by its really weird production choices. Like there's yeah. like little Casio keyboard sounds. Uh, they're, the band recorded, I think, two or three different versions of it, and the worst version is what's on the record. Oh, I've got some homework then. Because I yeah, so, almost like this song. Yeah. It, it's, it's like It sounds like what was on the radio in the mid-early 2000s, like the Sugar Ray and the Uncle Cracker songs. That's what it sounds like to me. Yeah, but his voice is like scratchy enough to almost have like that indie singer like you know it's not perfect and i think that's yeah. what keeps it from going over the top into the corny poppy stuff and into the almost like almost like it could have appeared on some indie movie from the time that didn't really have a plot or an ending but it was good because <laughs> the acting was good you know? and it was it starred zach braff yeah <laughs> oh man okay well the, the better versions of this, there's like the, they recorded like an acoustic only version later on, okay. which is much. Better. I could hear that. Okay, and which then uh, do we want to? I mean, I would say skip, but um, we're not going to. So the cold dark world, uh, again, written by the bass player Scott Schreiner, who is yeah. from Ohio. He's an Ohio guy, so I, I don't want to slag on him too hard. Well, you can't. That's um, the rules of the show. So. That's, <laughs> so I won't. He's a very good bass player. Yeah. Um, the, so I'll say that my rules for do I skip this track, it varies depending on what I'm doing. Yeah, sure. Uh, like if I'm in my car and I have the controls, I'll skip through a thousand tracks. It doesn't matter what I'm doing, where I am. If this song comes on, I'm probably going to skip it. It's, it's, they really tried to do something different. It just didn't work. 
Okay, okay, there's a point I want to make about that. Talk about automatic, and then we will sum up, and I will jump back into Cold Dark World. Can I give a little lyrical recitation from Cold Dark World to explain to everyone why we feel this way, though? I'd rather you didn't, but it's your show. <laughs> so here's what's going to happen. Um, there's, a, again, and so at near the end of the song, there's the lyrics. I am sincere. You don't need to fear. I'm not like the others. I'll be like a brother. I will protect you. Never disrespect you. But if you need love, then I'll be here to sex you. That was problematic then, and it's even more problematic now. It's like there, the, there's a lot of problematic things in this song with, like, the dude's going to come in and fix everything. I mean, even without that last final step, there is a lot of cringy stuff in there from that. But, but I, we can, let's just, let's think of the happy, the better songs in the album, and we'll go forward to Automatic. Again, uh, this one's written by Pat Wilson, who's a drummer, yeah. sung by him. Yeah. It's a nice song that he wrote for his wife. It's, it's fine. Song. And his voice is a nice contrast. It's, he doesn't sing on key exactly, but he has one of those voices where it works. Mm -hmm. like, I, yeah, absolutely. Singing off key and making it work is harder than singing on key and making it work. So it I'm going to give him props. And to it also, I'll say that the refrain of this song, too, has, again, it's got that weird sort of crunchy, darker guitar sounds that... that I, I was like going to mention that. There's some really cool guitar effects that pipe in every now and then. I really enjoyed that. And then and just again, I was going to say, this is another track where they recorded like three different versions. Oh. There's a version for um, the PlayStation game Gran Turismo 5. It's like a techno remix, and it's 100% better. I, I am going to definitely seek that out. So these three tracks, let's think about this. Weezer, or at least Rivers Cuomo, which if we haven't mm -hmm. said, Rivers Cuomo is the mastermind of Weezer, Weezer generally. It's, Lyrics. It's his band. It's his band, essentially. Huge Kiss fan. Massive Kiss fan. He sang about it in the song mm -hmm. In My Garage. And I almost wish, instead of sticking these three songs in there, what if they had done a massive release day where they did a Rivers album, a, and each band got their own uh, solo album like Kiss did that one time. This song and Green would have, Day did that too later. They did, you're right, and the Melvins. Um, you know, yeah. But that Cold Dark World would have been the Peter Chris song. It would have been the Peter Chris album of those. That, that would have been that. I don't know if anyone has listened to all of the solo Kiss albums. They're available on Hoopla, our streaming you service. Yeah. yeah, once uh, you're done here, just go go. Yeah, definitely, at least the, the Ace Fraley one. So anyway, that's about all I can say about those songs. That's, that's fair. I think that's fair to say. It was a good experimentation. We close out with like a classic Weezer album ending song. So this is like a lot of people when they hold up Weezer is they hold up um, the closer from the Blue Album, their first record. Oh, yes. Yeah. Only in Dreams. I blanked for a second. So good. And this is the closest they've gotten to that. It's, uh, it's called The Angel and the One. And it's, it's just one riff repeated over and over again. You and beat me to layer it. Layer on top of it, layer over layer over layer, and it just works. I rarely push the repeat button when I'm listening to anything. I have listened to this song, I bet you, 30 times on repeat. This is a perfect song after an album of not only like who's singing, who's writing, one song that has two billion parts in it, they close with, yeah. like you said, just one riff. And I am going, you know, I used to think it was controversial when anyone told me they liked anything past green, but what I'm about to say might be even more controversial. This is their best closing song. I like this better than Only in Dreams. It's a good thing you're not active on the message boards then because you get a lot of heat for that. So I want to delve into the multiverse here okay. and go into the multiverse and find the perfect version of this album because as we already talked about, Geffen Records made them uh, put Pork and Beans and Troublemaker on the record. It was originally a longer record uh, before Geffen Records made them rework it. So there's two B-sides and then there's actually a third that comes later on. But um, if you get the deluxe version, there's two B-sides called Pig and Miss Sweeney, which deserve to be on the album. They are uh, much better songs than tracks seven, eight, and nine. I know you told me that, uh, but I read that you, you, you mentioned that, I read some of the lyrics of Pig and it was just too sad. I it's, don't know. It's very sad. It's like a, it's a, it's a, 
it's a love song and you don't realize until like two minutes into the love song that it's being sung from the point of view of a pig who's on his way to the slaughterhouse. Yeah, so it mean, just gets real sad real quick. You're talking about a guy who can't even really think about the title Charlotte's Web without oh gosh without yeah. going through something. So but it's yeah, a so very Charlotte's Web kind of song. No, it's a good song. Okay. And then um, Miss Sweeney is this weird like the the verses are like mumble wrapped and the choruses are just these colorful pop music explosions. And it's okay. just a, a your basic love song. And it's so good. It's right. it's such a, a palate cleanser. I will take you up on that one then. So I will go listen to Miss Sweeney. Guys, everybody do the same. But in some version of the multiverse, there's there's a version of the Red Album where they, they took off, you know, Cold, Dark World and Automatic, and in, in their place they put those two B sides. And then you have an album where there's only like maybe one hard skip out of ten tracks. Which is solid. Very That's solid. solid. <laughs> All right. bands, most bands don't do that. No, definitely not. Not these days, at least. So, all right. Well, we're kind of looking at the time. I'm going to have to let you go do your thing. Uh, thanks very much, Keith. Good for joining us today. Is there oh, anything, is anything else you want to say? Oh, yeah. One last question. What, what, would you, what would you do to help someone like me who is stuck in that they, uh, they Weezer stopped making music in 96? Like, what, what's just a really quick sentence or two you could say to help them learn to love new Weezer? You can learn to love, so yeah, listen to the Red Album, uh, some of the later tracks from the White Album as well, where they, it's just, just pop music, it's guitar pop music, it's a nice breezy experience, just to close your eyes and let it go through you. You could also listen to a band called The Rentals, which is a oh. former bassist, his band, which is, it, it bridges that gap for those who think that, that Weezer disappeared in 96. They put out an album recently and it is available with your library card on our Freegal downloadable music is it? service it is well i know what i'm doing as soon as i go here check the comments section <laughs> all right keith i'm gonna let you go thank you so much all right thanks Ken. yeah bye all right everybody thank you so much for joining us for my favorite album is terrible thanks to keith for giving us some of his time again like we just said look in the comment section for links to listen to check out download all the things that we talked about in today's episode make sure you join us two thursdays from now at eight o'clock for the next episode of my favorite album is terrible look in the comment section we will reveal what that album is going to be in the comment section and also next week on our off week Follow the library's social media. We will put up a little promo video doing the big unveil for the album that we are going to talk about then. Again, if you enjoyed tonight's show, give us a like. Share it with anyone you think would be interested in joining in for a music show. And join us, like I say, join us coming up. We've got some good guests lined up. A few more people from the library. We also have some great people from just around the music scene in Cincinnati who are going to join us as guests. We have some great albums to talk about. We've got records by Metallica, Dave Matthews Band, um, Jay-Z, Cake, and Third Eye Blind. Some of the things we are going to talk about uh, coming up. Side note, I can still see our guest Keith in a window here, you know, giving you a little bit of behind the scenes magic of what's going on. When I said Third Eye Blind, he laughed. You're wrong, Keith. Third Eye Blind, is that first album is really, really good. So anyway, thanks again so much, everybody, for joining us, and we will see you two Thursdays from now at 8 o'clock.